so my name is Melanie Pocock and I am curator at ICON. I think that, well, I can speak for public galleries like ICON. Um, I think their role is vital and increasingly so because we're living in this environment where even the luxury of free speech, um, th what we read in the media, uh, culture wars as they are so called, are dividing society and it feels like there are fewer and fewer spaces in which one can actually have an open debate, address all sides of the argument without fear of being reprimanded or cancelled, you know? Um, and I really feel that public galleries like ICON have a key role to play in this respect. Um, ICON is free as well. Um, personally, I've always been committed to working in public galleries that have free admission. And I mentioned that too in relation to this question, because how can a gallery play a role in society if it is not accessible to society <laughs> in its broader sense? And um, I think if we want to have those open discussions and address all sides of the arguments from people from all kinds of backgrounds, that's where you have to start. And I kind of see the gallery as this this space in which that conversation can start through art, with artists, and through their unique visions that enable us also to see the world that we live in differently. So my practice uh, is rooted in an institution. Um, I've always seen myself as an institutional curator. It sounds conventional when you mention the word institution, but um, I've actually always been interested in how curatorial practice in its most imaginative and creative sense translates in that setting. How can it push um, certain, let's say, habitudes, speaking in French here, I'm bilingual so sometimes I think in French, um, but yeah, how can, um, how can you practice as a curator within an institution and, and use all of the tools that are at your disposal in an institution to realise a concept or work with an artist in a way that can um, reach its full ambition or explore its creative possibilities to the fullest extent. And when you work in an institution, that is what that can enable. Um, not just financial and budgets, of course, but having a head of communications and a communications team who can help you as a curator think about how an art work or artist and exhibition translates in social media, in communications, uh, learning, engagement programs, how can actually engaging with publics and audiences, even in the creation process of an artwork or working with an artist, can that be incorporated into the development, the curatorial development of an exhibition? So uh, I suppose what I mean by mentioning these colleagues as well is that I don't, I see my practice as collaborative but collaborative in a sense that really draws on the robust teams of institutions. Um, personally, also my background is important. My uh, mother is Malaysian Chinese and my father is British. And um, being someone of mixed descent, I've always been interested in questions of what does it mean to be international? Um, also in terms of the art world and for artists. In many ways, uh, contemporary art is characterised by the international. Many people think of the moment post-1989, for example, as a seismic shift. Um, the globalisation of art that was coupled with a sort of um, globalisation uh, known in world economics as well. Um, and so, with regards to internationalism, that dynamic 
exchange between cultures and artists in very different places, how an artist moving between cultures um, generates a specific quality to the kind of artwork that they're producing, uh, how can the conditions of moving between cultures and intercultural exchange actually shape exhibition making um, because again we have the phenomenon in recent past of the global uh, exhibition you know whereby curators are really working uh, not just with artists from other cultures and countries but dealing with the conditions of production and exchange that are involved in that you know which are political which are economical and and cultural you know how do you um, translate uh, very different ideas and ways of living in different cultures and bring that to the place in which your exhibition is happening. And I think those questions have always overarched the kinds of artists who I work with, the exhibition concepts that I come up with myself, uh, with more thematic exhibitions. And from there, to be honest, um, I'm pretty open when it comes to practice. I don't have a specialism, for example, in a particular media or a particular time period. Um, and in fact, I see it as my duty to question my own tastes and interests at a given time. Um, and when I think about the exhibitions I've worked on in the past, the ones that I have found most educational for myself and most generative in terms of working with a team and also for audiences are often the artists where at first when I've seen their work it's I haven't for some reason I just can't quite grasp it you know or um, there's something about it which um, I yeah I, I can't quite place or uh, and it's th those kinds of artists and artworks that I think have a sort of long longevity in terms of a curatorial relationship, like curator to artist. Because once you enter into that dialogue, the more you discover, the more you unearth, the more you learn. Um, as long as there's that initial trigger of intrigue, um, I think that you you as a curator also grow you know you're not just limiting yourself to what at first you might gravitate towards yeah that's um this there's so many roots into thinking about um well there's there's the line of accessibility i mean frankly on on an objective level there are certain things that just make people feel more welcome in an exhibition space whether it's light daylight as we have in Brit America at Lapa's show at the moment um, also seating especially if you've got video work or a painting that has many layers within it that you want people to really contemplate um, however I would also say that for me personally, when I'm putting together an exhibition, I think a lot about how the artwork itself should be fulfilling this role, both of engagement and accessibility and helping people to manoeuvre the space in a way that is both, um, let's say, it, it doesn't necessarily, um, it doesn't mean that it's an easy experience all the time, you know, even the fact that an exhibition can offer quite a challenging um, experience for the audience can also be really engaging and interesting, you know. Again, I think it's important not to take these things too literally. Um, but yes, I, I, I have approaches uh, such as, for example, with building walls, uh, often in exhibitions, particularly if it's a group exhibition or one that's addressing a time span. Um, rooms are created, you know, lots of walls are built to divide the space. Uh, you often see this in 
art biennials as well, where rooms are created for specific artists and artworks, also so each artist feels like they have their own space. But to me, um, I personally dislike that <laughs> strategy. Uh, for one, when it comes to a group exhibition, I think the point of doing that is to bring works into a physical dialogue, right? To create sight lines across multiple artworks. Um, what's the point in divvying up the space? You might as well offer a solo show. I mean, really? So I always have that in my mind when it comes to group exhibitions in particular. Um, but also I, I think that so much of the time when you look at an artwork in a different way or engage in a dialogue with an artist, particularly with work that's more installation based and you're really, uh, the artist is actually really responding to the space, um, that there are so many opportunities for the artwork itself to divvy up and carve up space in an interesting way and much more interesting than just building a wall. It might be a curtain, it might be a sculpture that's also some kind of um, border to a concept in that area or that zone of the show. Uh, it even might be that spillage, physical or sound, is an interesting dimension to the experience that um, can be welcomed, you know? So, um, yeah, in essence, that's how I think about it. My approach as a curator um, tends to be to really follow from what the artist wants. You know, uh, I think we have a duty, uh, especially when it comes to a contemporary art space, to um, help artists think imaginatively and um, I, I never like to curtail that for its own sake, you know, and in fact often when the artist comes with a proposal or idea, uh, it's often challenging, you know, uh, an existing way in which the space is used or thought of and um, it's really interesting learning also for me how an artist sees a space differently to me. Um, at the same time, of course, as a curator working in an institution where you become very accustomed to the spaces in which you're working, you have a, a great knowledge about the space, right? I mean, different shows, different configurations, how audiences have navigated more or less easily certain shows, um, hidden or more detailed aspects of the architecture that the artist if uh, they're coming new and fresh into a space, won't necessarily know. So as a curator, you have all of this knowledge to offer. Uh, and so in a dialogue with an artist, you're wanting to offer this too. And not necessarily to dictate what they then do, but rather to offer that opportunity, as I like to put it. Um, and in the case of Betsy Bradley, actually in this, this painting that doubled as a wall, um, it pretty much started from a conversation of walking through the space and the uh, wall that was there, um, I said to Betsy, you know, that can be removed. We could think about a work that, you know, actually takes its place. And I, I suppose that possibility wouldn't have entered her mind and she wouldn't have elaborated it in the beautiful way that she did if I hadn't basically said to her that was possible. Um, and. I suppose also when it comes to group exhibitions, I think the role of the curator does become much more present in terms of um, helping to shape the look and feel of artworks. Um, but that's also to do with trying to create a sense of balance between artists and artworks. So you, you have the overall responsibility for the overall show, but then you also have a responsibility to each artist to sort of make sure that their vision feels like it's being realised in its best way. And sometimes that can come into a conflict with another artist's proposal. So, um, but again, I, I, I do think that when that happens, that the curator's role uh, is often also to establish a dialogue. You know, it might be that uh, another artist comes with a proposal and 
some kind of conflict might emerge, whether it's conceptually it doesn't fit alongside somebody else that you've thought, okay, that would be great in this uh, section of the show. Uh, it might be physically, you know, to do with sound or um, just, yeah, it not feeling quite right alongside. But um, often it can help to then sort of introduce, you know, both artists, make them aware of each other and what they are doing, and you as a curator mediating between that. Um, and it takes a lot of, you know, time and energy, those conversations, but I think when they happen, you can really tell in an exhibition, you know. You know, I was thinking about this question on the way here and the one that popped up in my mind and that has really stayed with me was um, the 2012 edition of Documenta. I think it was 13, curated by um, Karolin Christoph Barkakiev, who is the director of Castello di Rivoli in Turin, I believe. Um, and I... What, what was great about this exhibition is Documenta is this expansive exhibition. Every five years, um, takes over multiple sites, indoors and outdoors, in Kassel, in Germany. Um, I'd never been to the exhibition before. It was my first time. But what Carolyn did, which I thought was incredibly smart, was that she didn't come with some kind of overarching thematic that every artist had to address. She actually had no theme. <laughs> and yet, somehow, all of the artists she had invited to either create new work or present existing work, there was this beautiful synchronicity that seemed to emerge through what felt to me like the kinds of conversations that we've been talking about, these deep negotiations with artists and between artists, with groups of artists, where artists are aware of what other artists are doing. You know, it's a shared conversation. And there were beautiful moments of poignancy and subtlety, as well as strength. Um, a lot of it felt based on feeling, and um, I remember in the main venue of the exhibition um, that is the museum in Castle, which I suppose for many people visiting this exhibition is the first encounter they have with it. The first room, you walked into it and it was essentially empty. <laughs> uh, save for three artworks, uh, one of them was a sound piece by Seal Floyer, and it was an excerpt from a song on loop, repeat, and the lyrics were, and I'll just keep on till I get it right, I'll just and I'll just keep on, on till I get it till right. I get it right. That's all you could hear. There was also a slight breeze in the space. And this, I later found out, was also an artwork by Ryan Gander, which he had developed with a university, very technical, basically to create wind in an indoor space. <laughs> so you had this breeze and this refrain on repeat, and then, in a vitrine, so it wasn't actually empty, but a, a lonely vitrine in the space. And inside the vitrine was a letter from the artist Kai Altoff to the curator, Carolyn, basically explaining how he felt like he couldn't produce an artwork for this exhibition and listing the various reasons why. I just, I found that just a beautiful gesture you know, that went against almost every expectation that you would have of a grand blockbuster seminal exhibition. And in many ways, it was also confronting the possibility of failure 
and that failure for so many artists is intrinsic to their process, you know? And to do that, I thought, was incredibly brave um, and really set the tone, I think, for what was a very empathetic edition of Documenta. I think the biggest challenge is Negotiation. It's a skill which often isn't talked about when it comes to curating, but when I think about what I do on a daily basis, and no matter with whom as part of my job, whether it's an artist, whether it's colleagues, whether it's external collaborators or stakeholders, um, you're often negotiating, you know? Um, their interests, your interests, the interests of the place in which you work. Um, and it's not easy, you know? How do you argue for art and things that you really believe in? How do you convince other people that that is the way to go? How do we reach compromise? How do we in turn appreciate that in others, you know, that their arguments need to be heard at different times. And it's a cliche, but it's true. You know, not, you don't need to win every battle. I think that's important. There's too many battles to fight in everyday life, generally. <laughs> um, yeah, I, in, in the broadest sense, that feels like a challenge. More specifically in the now, thinking about your first question and galleries and their role in society, um, we are finding ourselves in a world where I think economic pressures, I mean, inflation, Often the things that we need to do to improve one area of our lives has a negative effect on another. So climate change, for example, actually, for us to really achieve the net zero, carbon zero targets that we need to, you have to reduce activity, you have to scale down, you have to be more modest, ultimately. And yet, the demands and perhaps even the need for creativity, for us to produce exhibitions and offer more programs, feels like it often goes against that, you know? How do you juggle between the two? Um, I don't think it's as simple as even 20 years ago when there was this narrative of, of growth. Um, I'm thinking about you know new labor those years pre that financial crisis in 2009 where it just felt like you would build and, and produce more and good things would flow from that you know um, but yeah I think now that it's not so straightforward and in some respects as a curator or a gallery you have to decide what your priorities are and risk, in a way, not meeting others. So my favourite part of my job is definitely working with artists. There's never a dull day, that's for sure. But the, the different ways that they see the world, um, the references they draw on, their knowledge, uh, I have the privilege of working with artists, you know, not just from Birmingham or the UK, but internationally. And every day I feel like I have a conversation which broadens my own horizons. And uh, it's a well-known fact that we are happiest when learning. And so I believe every day in my job I'm learning something new, so I couldn't be happier.